Well, I hope you're ready to get started. I, I was thrilled this morning. Last week, I had a, I had a, um, uh, email come from one of our um, uh, churches, off in another part of the country, that is using our Bible study materials. It's just a thrill, and they, they'd come up to the fourth lesson on First Corinthians, and it was short for some reason when we recorded it and got it on the website. We didn't put it all on there, so they called and. Uh, needed for us to update the website so they could show it. So not only do y'all get it, but other people are getting it in other churches, and that's just a thrill. I remember when they called and asked if they could do it with permission. I said, absolutely, it's yours. Go use it, whatever. Do we owe you anything? No, you only owe God, because it's all God's whatsoever. Well, as uh, Jesus had fed the 5,000 men and plus women and children. You got that? 5,000 men. Then we have to count the women. And we have to count the children. Jesus had taken five loaves of bread and two fishes, and he had blessed it. And in reality, as he broke it, he had created food from which there was no food. He really created matter, just as he created it in the very beginning, out of nothing. He created enough food from five little loaves and two fishes to feed 5,000 men, plus their, his, their wives, plus their children. This is a huge crowd that he has fed. There were 12 basketfuls of food left over. They gathered that food all up, put it in the boats with them as they headed off across the Sea of Galilee. As I told you last week, that was the apex, that was the height of Jesus' ministry. Up until that point, there was very little negative that had been said about him or to him except... Yes, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees were coming and they were listening to him and there had been questions, but there really had not been any negative questions going on. But while Jesus is feeding that 5,000 on the hill there at the seashore of Sea of Galilee, down in Jerusalem they have decided that they need to stop the actions of Jesus. So they have sent forth an envoy of scribes and Pharisees for the purpose of truly cataloging all the indiscretions that Jesus would do against the rabbi's laws, the laws of the synagogue, the laws that they had made. And their intention was to hem Jesus in, to, to like put him through a, a funnel or like a cattle gate to get him down into where he had no place to move. Have you ever felt like that in your life? Have you ever felt like you had no place to go? Where you had, you, you had to make decisions and yet decisions that would change your life and you're between a rock and you're a hard place and what you wanted to do, you couldn't do because you were doing other things. You ever felt that way? Ever been hemmed in? Ever been hemmed in? Back in 1968, I was 12 years old. It's summertime. I'd ridden my bicycle uh, out down, down Sycamore Avenue to Bucko Daniels Barbershop. Bucko Daniels was an incredible musician, but he was also a pretty good barber. He and his son Mike had a barbershop down there. This morning when I got there, yeah, the sh it was during the middle of the week, the shop was full of people. Some of them uh, had on white suits with we were white with red ties and there were some blue suits and just people and they all had this slick back greasy hair you know and little mustache that were stashes that were 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 just so so you know just so so nobody had a beard it was just little mustaches and and they all looked like they had a little makeup on or something you know it just was strange and I'm 12 years old and so I sit down in the little seat, and as the person gets up, somebody else comes in, and people are standing around. They're all talking about this stuff, you know, this music stuff going on across the street at the Assembly of God College there in Waxahachie. And uh, Bucko Daniels Barbershop was right across from SAGC, the Assembly of God, uh, Southwestern Assembly of God College there. And so it came, comes my time, and I sit up in the seat, and they put this little piece of paper around you, you know, this little, you know, you can see through it. I don't know what it's for. And then they wrap that thing around you, put this big old long clip, looks like a four ship or something, you know, down on top of it. 
And I'm sitting there, and this long, tall, lanky, skinny guy comes walking in the door, and he's got it slicked back, and he's in his suit, and he's proper, and he's got cufflinks that are dangling like jewels. And Buck O'Daniel says to me, Jimmy, Jimmy, you need this man's autograph. And he was, he was standing right there, I mean, right there. And I'm looking, I, I remember saying to him, who are you? And he said to me, I'm a nobody, son. I'm a nobody. He said, I'm going to give you my autograph anyway. So he takes out this card and he writes his name on the back of the card. He says, son, you know, we're having a music school across the street. And if you want to come tonight, we're having a big concert. And everybody, everybody who's anybody is going to be there. It was the last night. And I didn't know who all these people were. He says, if you want to come, come to the stage door and give them this card. And we'll let you stand back with all the singer, singers out there. Before we sing, singer, you got that? Singers. So I rode my bike home and I told mom and mom said, sure, you can go. Now, I do not understand the logic of my mother allowing me to drive, ride away on my bike about four miles away at six o'clock at night. It just makes no sense to me today. I, I guess we lived in a different world back then. So I show up and... I don't even know who this guy is at the time. I mean, on the back of the card, it said, because it just, on the other side, it said, London, Paris, and the Apostles. And I didn't know who they were. I didn't, didn't bother me a bit. I didn't know who London, Paris was. I didn't know he had taken J.D. Sumner's place with the Blackwood Brothers. I didn't, I didn't know who that was. I didn't know that he had started a new group. I didn't, and, and I get on their stage, and I'm standing there by the curtain. They've placed me right there so I can see everybody. And it is this family atmosphere in the backstage. And this lady comes in, and her, she's, she's about this big around, and her hair's about this big, and it's about that tall. And she's flipping this handkerchief around, trying to tell everybody what to do. And in comes her husband, he's about like this. And they go on stage, and she reaches down, and she kisses me and says, Honey, we're so glad you're back here. And they go off on stage, and I thought it was the funny looking thing. That, her husband played the piano like this. <laughs> Didn't even look down at the keys. Just played it. Well, you, within the year, I would know who I'm standing by. I, I would gather on. That was Vestal Goodman and Howard Goodman and Rusty Goodman and Sam Goodman and J.D. Sumner and Ed Enoch and Donnie Sumner and Bill Bays, who was an incredible tenor. They would go on to sing with Elvis, okay? You got that? And that was London, uh, uh, London, Paris, and his new group called the Apostles. And there was James Blackwood, and uh, just all the Blackwoods. You got it all. You ever Blackwood? You, you just you couldn't even move without running into a Blackwood back in those days. And and and, and, um, and uh, the the baritone in his was his cousin or whatever it was, and I forget what his name was now, it's just slipped me, and all back there. And plus there's this group from Mississippi, and there's this group from here, and the group from there, and, and there's this new group called the Prophets that were there. And, uh, wrote, and, and then there was this guy, he had this mustache just so fine, and, and, and you've heard me probably say this before in these, in these groups, and they all had mustaches, and oh, you know, when the, I thought it, the guy sang the strangest thing when he went out and said, prayer. You know, he did like that. It's Hobie Lister and, and uh, Jay Cass and, and um, Big Chief Worthington and Doy Odd. And so there I am in the midst of that. And I have, all, all it took was the car just to get in. Just there. And they all loved and everything. I rode my bike home and I thought, well, that was good, you know. Was, didn't even know it. Well, after that, every year I never could afford to go to school. The Stamp School of Music is what it was. I never could afford to go, but they always had shows every night because they did things different. They didn't just put you in class and teach you how to do it. They made you do it on stage, and they wanted an audience out there. So any time during the day, you could go out, and groups were performing all, all day. And then on the last night, all the big groups came in. So I was there from the time I was 12 until I was 18. I was there every single year just hanging around. I never got a private lesson back in the back, but I was always hanging around running chords and doing things like that for him. It was the second semester of college, 1975. <clears throat> and I am going to school um, on a work scholarship for all practical purposes. Uh, I was the, the uh, stage, I'm the shop manager and I built all the sets. <clears throat> and we were doing the Sound of Music at Kilgore College and I 
Didn't try out for any of the major parts because I knew I was going to have to be hanging scenery and doing all that, and I was going to be the stage manager that year. That's what they asked me to do instead of trying out for a part. And there's a reason why they didn't want me to try out for a part, and that's another story for another day in time. Uh, they didn't want me trying out, so I wasn't trying out. Uh, and I never will forget, it was dress rehearsal night. It was the night before we were to, to start the musical, and a guy by the name of Melvin Marshall was doing it. We would run it for two weeks. It would be packed every night. It was just, it was incredible. Kilgore was, had an incredible music school. And I run back out to the church. And, and I went by the preacher's office. He said to me, Jim, he said, this man from, uh, from Mississippi just called you. And he says, if you come back within 30 minutes, you're to give him a phone call. Well, sure enough, I picked up the phone. It said, please call Collect. So I, I called Collect. <laughs> had no other way to call. I'm glad he said call Collect. <laughs> The bass voice on the other end of the phone said, Son, we're in, we're in, we're in Shreveport tonight, and we're doing a concert, and our tenor has quit on us. I need you here in about three hours. they will give us two hours to run over the songs with you, and um, you're going to go to work for us. I'm going to pay you $225 a month. I'll feed water and dress you, but you're going to have to move out here to Mississippi. And I'm thinking, I'm making $75 a month. I have a 32 At this point in time, I'm making 70 I still have my $32 a month car payment, which my car is not even fixed yet. I have no way to get to Shreveport, but I could hear my little voice of my father saying, son, when you start a job, finish it, even if it hurts. God will never take you someplace that you're not supposed to be. If you're supposed to be in a project, finish it. When people are relying on you, make sure you get the project done. Well, they were relying on me. I'd worked all those shows. I'd worked all the rehearsals. I was the one who was pulling the curtains. I was the one who was calling the shots on the, on the dimmer board and the, and the lights. This was dress rehearsal night. And there'd be hundreds there. Dotson Auditorium held 500. There'd be 500 there every night. And I remember saying to the deep bass voice on the other end of the phone, I can't be there tonight. I'm doing a show and I can't be there. He said, son, thank you for your honesty. And he hung up on me. And the phone call never came again. Ever. You see, for all my high school years, all my dreams were to be was to be a southern gospel singer. Singer. You got it? And get a bus. Be riding on a bus. And going from here to there and being a singer with a southern gospel group. The opportunity came and the opportunity never came again. On that day, I was hemmed in. I was hemmed in like down a funnel where I had to make a decision. A decision that would change the direction of my life for the rest of my life. What would have happened if I had gone off to Mississippi to be with those boys? What would, where would I have been? What, what would have gone on? $225 a month and he'd feed, water me, and clothe me. Because we always wore the same type of suits and the same ties back in those days. What would have become of that? I needed an education. But more than that, I needed to make sure that have fulfilled my obligations that I've made. Well, Jesus has come to earth to fulfill his obligations. And the Pharisees and the, apost and the scribes are trying to get him off track. And they're trying to influence what's happening in the people's lives around him. Let's pick up right there. Verse, chapter 7, verse 1 says, And the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered together around him when they had come from Jerusalem. And had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. Folks, this is some of that food that's left over from the 12 basket full of food. They've put it into their boats and they've gone on to the other side of the shore. And back in those days, the Jews, Jewish men, before you ate supper, not only did you have to be physically washed and cleaned, but you had to be ceremonially washed and cleaned. And so a man had to go wash his hands and then do the washing ceremony before he could eat any meal. So he'd wash his hands in water, and then he would take, and he had, they would carry around with them, two little um, cups that were about the, half the size of, of an eggshell. You got to you take an egg, cut it in half. You got two little cups. After you've washed your hands, you would hold your hand up like this, 
clenching your, pin, your, your pinkies together, and you would take one cup of that water, a little bitty, half a cup of eggshell, half an eggshell size, and pour it over your hand, and if it rolled off your elbow, that hand was clean. And then you would take the other cup with the other hand and you'd pour it over this and if it rolled off your elbow, that one was clean. If it didn't roll off your elbow, you weren't clean and you couldn't eat. You'd have to go back and start the whole process of washing your hands and getting your arms and everything clean and start it over. Of course, if your arms are clean and the water runs off, it runs off and drips off your elbow, you're clean. If you still got dirt down here, the water's going to just make a mud puddle as it goes down. It's not going to run off so you're not clean. It made no difference to whether your hands were clean, whatever. You, you had to be ceremonially clean. So these Pharisees and these scribes are not complaining about whether, whether their hands were clean before they reached in and grabbed some of that food, some of that bread, no, fish and chips left in the, you know, that was fish and chips, left in those 12 baskets. They were concerned about whether they were ceremonially clean. Well, Jesus answers them. Actually, the Pharisees go on to ask Jesus this in verse 5. He says, And the Pharisees and the scribes ask Him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders? They eat their bread with impure hands. Traditions of the elders. You got that? By this time, and we've already seen this discussed in the text of Mark, the elders were teaching the traditions of the elders, but not the traditions of God's law of the Old, Old, Old Testament. They started off by making these little laws that were loosely uh, based on Old Testament laws of Moses. And then another group of elders would come along in another generation or next, and they would make another set of laws that were based on the set of laws that were loosely based on the Lord's laws from Moses. As the generations went down, they made some more laws that were based on these laws, that were based on those laws, that were based on... It's just like gossip going on. And with each set of laws, they get worse and worse and worse and away from God's laws. And finally, they're only holding on to these 613 laws that really have nothing to do with God's laws whatsoever. So... They're trying to hem Jesus in by saying, You're not, your people are not holding to the traditions. You got it? Traditions of our elders. So Jesus answers them back in verse 6 and says, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. Now I'm not so quite so sure, since I'm not God, I would use the hypocrites in front of them and call them that, but Jesus did. And Isaiah did. Isaiah prophesied that the hypocrites would come and that they would be from the religious folks. As it is written, he goes on to say, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. The Pharisees and scribes are saying, We love the Lord. But that's outside. But that's not where their heart is. He goes on to say, verse 7, But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. In vain. In vain they honor him. Mean in emptiness. The word vain means emptiness. They honor him. Teaching the precepts of men. <clears throat> now i got to show you this. I'm going to lay my lesson down. i got to show you this. Uh, a month or so ago, we had a lady come to my office, and uh, I've already asked her if I can... I can I'm not going to call her name, but I've asked her if I could tell the story because she came in really burdened down because God had not done what she thought God promised her that He would do. Uh, she had lost her job and things were not going well and she was at home watching some of the um, TV folks tell her what God, uh, how God works in your lives. And, and the TV folks had, had told um, her to go get her wallet and her checkbook and to lay it out on the table, or I'll put it in her hand and put it out over the table, or keep it on the table, and every moment when she would think about it, she should go in and put her hand on that checkbook or her wallet and pray this prayer. In the name of Jesus, be filled. Well, she had done it for a month, and... She, you know, the bank was charging her charges and she was losing money instead of making money in her checkbook. You see, there's a whole denomination of 
people who are out there who think and teach that you can speak to your wallet and it'll be filled. They need to speak to them and say, if you want your wallet to be filled, go get a job. So I said to her, did you ever hear them say, go get a job? No, they just say, speak to your wallet and the Lord will fill it with money. I said, where do you think the money comes from? He who does not work should not eat. Well, I know that's in the scripture, but I never thought about that. I didn't put two and two together. You see, that is an example of a precept of man that seems godly. It seems religious. It seems right. But it's totally wrong. So too, these Pharisees and scribes were teaching the precepts of man. Teaching things that was not, were not accurate. Well, Jesus goes on in verse 8 and just slaps them up against the face. And I, I want to go, Jesus, ooh, two, this is good. You know, you slam dunk here for the Lord. Of course, that's the only thing you expect since He's God. Verse 8, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the traditions of man. And He also was, he, and was, also, he also was saying to them, you nicely, got that nicely, in a nice sort of way, kind of with that smile on your face, you nicely set aside the commandment of God in order to keep your traditions. You just, yeah, it's there, and we don't say anything against the commandment of God, but our traditions are more important than God's traditions. In God's words, what He's saying. And they do it in a nice way. And then Jesus picks up and says, For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him be put to death. There's a death sentence right there, folks. Do not honor your father and your mother. You deserve to die a death penalty according to the Mosaic law. And they'd put you to death if you did not honor your father and mother. Now what does honor father and mother mean? It's this. You should not ever do anything that brings a dishonor to your father and mother. That means you should not do anything that would harm your parents' name. That would, whenever they heard, it would disgrace them. That when they heard of something that you have done, it would cause them to be grieved. That's how you honor your father and mother. Now as a child, you honor your father and mother by obeying them. But when you leave and cleave to a wife and go on and do your own thing, that's when you leave. And now the way you honor your father and mother is by making sure that you don't do anything that dishonors them. Folks, you know what I'm talking about. So every one of us in here, we've had a point, in fact, almost every one of us in here, where, where our parents got older, and as they got older, you know, they weren't thinking exactly right. And as they weren't thinking exactly right, you would end up in a conversation with them day after day after hour after hour, and you're trying to talk rationally to them, and they don't talk back rationally to you at all. And finally, you are so frustrated, you end up in arguments with them, and they want to do this, and you, th and you know what's right to do, but they just don't understand it. Cut to the chase here, there comes a time with our parents, when if their mind goes away, it's time for us, and even, I'll tell you this, it even happens with husbands and wives, folks, where you just do what they need to, you need to do to take care of them. You go and you take their the, 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 lock, the key to their, their mailbox, and you go pay their bills, and you know, and six months later, they'll come in and say, I need to pay my bills this month. And so you bring them in and you write out the checks with them and all that. And you go out the door and say, Mama, I'll mail these. And you tear them up because you've already paid them. You know what I'm saying? You just don't get in an argument with them anymore. You just bring them honor by just helping them and doing what they need that's right. We all come into that point in time. There's a reason why I've said that to you is because Jesus now explains or, or brings up one of the 613 lousy laws. You got that? Lousy, corrupt laws of the traditions of the elders. He says, but you say, verse 11, if a man says to his father or his mother, anything of mine you might, uh, anything of mine you might have been helped by is Corbin. The word Corbin there, Mark hangs on to that word Corbin. It's an Aramaic word and he hangs on to it for a reason. You no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your traditions which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. Well, that doesn't mean anything to you. Uh, the, the whole meaning of this is tied up in that word Corbin. Father and mother comes along and they've got a need, and you're supposed to honor your father and mother. Now you have the provisions for that need. Let's say that father and mother needs $100, and you have $100 but you don't want to give it to your father and mother. No. 
So all you have to say under the Jewish law is Corban, which means I have already given this as a gift to God. You see the picture? I have already given this hundred dollars as a gift to God. I cannot give it to you, mother and father. That was the Jewish tradition law set up by the rabbis. It's not over with yet. That's only the first part of it. See, father and mother have a need of a hundred dollars. You don't want to give them the hundred dollars as a child, so you just say, I've already given this gift to God. Then it goes on to say, he says, thus you invalidate the word of God by what you would do with it next. And follow this. The rest of that saying was, but if you have a need, you can use that hundred dollars for yourself, but we do not permit you to change your mind and give that hundred dollars to your mom and dad. So follow me here. Now I'm not saying this is the way it is, but you'll all understand this example of this. Daddy and Mama have a light bills come in. They they're hundred dollars short. You got a hundred dollars, but you've got a date tonight with your fiance, and you need that hundred dollars to go with your fiance tonight. So you say to Mom and Dad, "I've already given my hundred dollars that I have to God, and now you're not permitted to help them at all because you've already said that gift's been given to God. But now you come over here, that gift's been given to God, but the but the." Mose I mean, the pharisaical law allows you to use it for yourself so you can take your date out and spend the hundred dollars. In other words, Jesus has caught them in a lie and a corruption. And almost all of their 613 laws had one side to it and another side which always ended in corruption and lies. So Jesus has said, hey, you're doing it wrong, Pharisees, by hanging on to your traditions. <laughs> well, this the deceptive traditions of this nature are throughout all of, of what the Pharisees and the scribes would do. So Jesus had turned the table on these Pharisees and these scribes and he was infuriating them even more. Well, Jesus needed a rest. He'd always been around crowds. Always with crowds. So what does he do? Verse 14. And after he called the multitude to him again, he began saying to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside the man which going into him can defile him, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. The Pharisees are there. He's addressed their question. He's turned the tides back on them, and then he turns to the multitudes that are always there. He says to the multitudes, Look here, look. These, mul these Pharisees are saying, You pick up food with a hand that's got fish guts and slime on it and eat it, and that defiles the man because he's not clean. Jesus says, nothing you pick up and you put into your body defiles the man. Nothing. That's not what defiling happens. That's not how it happens. Because it doesn't go from your mouth to your heart. It goes from your mouth to your stomach. It, food is used for fuel and for energy to keep this body moving so that we can live for the Lord. And yet, the Pharisees didn't want to have it that way. Well, listen to what Jesus goes on to say in verse 17. <clears throat> and when leaving the multitude, he had entered his house. And that's going to be Peter's house. He's gone back to his home base. And his disciples questioned him about the parable. <laughs> his disciples questioned him about what he just said about the food. <laughs> and he said to them, Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand? Okay, let's paraphrase that to the day. He's talking to his twelve, who have already gone out two by two, and they have cast out demons and they healed people. They've worked miracles on their own. <coughs> they have seen him do all this miraculous stuff. They've listened to him. They've seen him feed the 5,000. They've not gathered any understanding from the feeding of the 5,000. He's had to explain everything to them. He just ends up having to come walking across the water already. We've already seen that in Mark. And, and, and he was going to walk past them but, because they were so afraid. And finally he gets in the boat so they'll understand he is God. And they don't understand this little thing about food going into your mouth doesn't defile you. No, because you're Jewish. Jewish, you're not going to eat a pig because that food will defile you. No, Jesus is saying, uh-uh. That Jewish law, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Nothing you put in your mouth defiles you. He basically is saying is, do I have a bunch of stupid disciples or what? 
Are you so dumb you, haven't, you don't catch on to this? Listen to what he goes on to say. He says, Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from the outside cannot defile him, because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach, and is eliminated. I love that word, eliminated. Cookie, where are you, Cookie? Where's Cookie? That's a good word for you. Next time you need to talk about something whenever you're telling us about medical things and you need to talk about that area, call it the eliminated. Lem eliminator, yes. It goes in your mouth, it goes to your stomach, and then it goes to the el eliminator. It get, you know, it's just God's nature, okay? It's just what it is. It goes to the eliminator. It doesn't go past the heart. The food goes in and becomes energy for the body to keep the blood pumping and all of that and give energy. But it doesn't go to the heart. <laughs> Verse 20. And he was saying, That which proceeds out of the mouth, out of the mouth, that is what defiles the man. For with, from within, out of the heart of men proceed the evil thoughts, fornication, theft, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting, and deeds of wickedness, as well as deceit, and sensuality, and envy, slander, pride, and deeds of foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. They come from the heart. They don't come from what you put in. You can eat all that fish and chips you want. You can go out there and grab any little critter and dip it in honey and eat it, and it's just fine. You can have any animal that's out there, eat it, and it's just fine. It doesn't defile you and make you a slanderer or a liar or a, an evil person of any way, form, or fashion because all of that that defiles and truly defiles a man comes bubbling up from within. And there's not a one of you in here that hadn't had something like that bubble up from inside of you and defile you from within to out because we're all human nature, have human nature. And it's that thing that bubbled up outside of us, from within inside of us to our outside that caused us to know that we needed a Savior and we need to be saved from our sins. Verse 24. And, when he, uh, and from there he arose and went away to a region of Tyre. A region of Tyre. Tyre was actually about 30 miles away from the Gal Sea of Galilee where he was on that day, uh, from Capernaum. And he goes out there, and Tyre is not in Israel. Tyre is in Syria in, the, in this day and time. So, but he's not going to Tyre. He's just going to the region of it, and that's several miles this side uh, to the east side of Tyre. He's headed off that way. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know it, of it, Yet he could not escape notice. Jesus had gone to a country that was not Jewish. He is no longer in the Jewish areas. He in the, he's in the Gentile areas. And he goes into a house to rest and he doesn't want anybody to know about it. But guess what? Every, every place he went, rumors went. I mean, it's like stink on a skunk. You can wash that animal all you want but it still smells like skunk. You can take it anywhere, and it's still a skunk. I know that's a bad example, but you take Jesus anywhere, and He's still the Messiah. You can take Him to where he, whatever house He was going to, or wherever He was trying to go and be by Himself, be it out in the woods, be it out in the, on the top of a hillside, be it down in a stone by the water, or into somebody's house in another nation, which is where He was. And the rumors were following him and everybody knew where he was and they were, they were coming to him because they knew he had the ability to heal because it stuck to him because he was the Messiah. Verse 25, But after hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the uh, Syrophoenician race. Syro, meaning... Syria. And she's Phoenician. The Phoenician people were the seagoing people who made the boats. In fact, whenever Jonah went down on got, got in a boat on the island of Joppa, he got into a Phoenician boat. Whenever the Egyptians needed boats, they would buy those boats from the Phoenician people who made them and then usually hired the Phoenicians to sail their boats for them as well as all the other countries too. They were the masters of the Mediterranean Sea. 
That's the Phoenicians. They're also descendants of the Canaanites. And so they're Canaanite people also. And she's a Gentile. She is not a Jew. And she's got a daughter that's got a problem. And she's going to come and she's going to beg Jesus to heal that daughter. And it goes on to say, And she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Verse 27. And he was saying to her, This is a very difficult passage here. It's really not that difficult after I'll get through with it. But it's difficult here when you're just reading it. Let the children be satisfied first. For it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. We don't understand that today. And that's all Mark tells us about it. Why? Because the Romans he's writing to understand this. But we don't understand what he means by this. Because it's not correct in our thinking as Christians. In the, but you have to remember, the whole volume of how the church is to react and how the church is to live and how Christians is to live is not truly written yet. Because Christ has not died on the cross yet. So we don't understand what he's saying here. Let's go on. But she said, she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, Because of this answer, go your way. The demon has gone out from your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child laying on the bed, the demon having departed. This is interesting. You remember just a few days before, Jairus, who was a synagogue official, a religious leader from Capernaum, had a daughter who was dying. And he left (coughs) his house and he went down to the Sea of Galilee to beg Jesus to go and heal his daughter at his house. Jesus hears of the plight and he heads off and goes towards the house about four miles away. Along the way... The crowd is moving, and it's a huge crowd, and there's this lady that comes through the crowd who has an issue of blood, and she just wants to touch his, the hem of his garment, and she does, and she's healed. He goes on to Jairus' house, and the daughter has already died. Jesus goes in, and he heals the daughter, and comes out and presents her and says, Give her something to eat. She's hungry. In front of all the Jews. But here, Jesus doesn't even go to this, Greek, this uh, Gentile lady's house. He just says, great is thy faithfulness, woman. That's the way it says in the King James. Great is thy faithfulness. Go on home. Your daughter is healed. He didn't have to be there for the daughter. He healed the daughter because of the pleading of the mother. She's a Gentile. Which means Jesus didn't have to be anywhere where he was going to heal people. If an envoy came and said, please heal so and so, he could have healed healed that person from wherever he was. But see, he's bringing the message to the Jews. And the Jews are the ones who need to change their hearts. And the Jews are the ones who need to see how how they need to move away from all the rabbinical laws that were going on and the traditions of the rabbis. They come to shake up that system and change it. Change it to where it was supposed to be. It was all in God's plan for the Jewish system to turn into Christ's system and all the Jews to be saved. That was part of God's, God's plan, but He knew it wouldn't happen. He also had promised that the message was going to come to the Jews first and then be taken on to the Gentiles. It's going to come to the Jews and all those who would believe would become his followers and those followers would take that message on to the Gentiles. <coughs> Peter, uh, Paul spends a lot of time in his letters telling us that fact. It comes first to, the, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. What about the dog thing? What, why does he use the word dog in this? Why, did, why does he call this Gentile a dog? Do the Romans understand this? Absolutely. We don't understand it, but let's, let's grab Matthew. I, don't, I haven't used the other Gospels when we've gone through the Mark to parallel them because we'll get to them soon. But here we need help from Matthew who's explaining to us. Verse, chapter 15 of Matthew, verse 21 says, and G, same story, but just a... Matthew adds a line that the Jews need to know about and we need to know about it because we're really of that Jewish descent, folks. We've been changed from that Jewish descent to Christ and we really, because we've studied so much, we think like they're supposed to have thought, like the Jews are supposed to have thought, like Paul thought now and like Peter thinks as as saved people. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman came out from the region and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord. 
son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her, her a word. And his disciples came to him and kept asking him, saying, Send her away, for she is shouting out after us. Can't you, can, you, can you picture that in your mind? Jesus, Jesus, disciples, I've got a daughter on these healed. There's not a mother in here that whether you were Jew or Gentile wouldn't go find Jesus if you knew that he could heal your daughter. You got that? In fact, there's been many of you who are in here who your children have been on crack and cocaine and often to all sorts of things that you've come just to try to, to my office to try to find an answer of, of how to handle them. And you've pled out to Jesus to heal them. You'll go anywhere you can for your kids. And this Gentile woman is no different. And she's going and she's pleading to Jesus, Heal my daughter. <clears throat> they at, and, and his disciples begged him to send her away. Verse 24. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. Jesus said, well, he, he, Jesus says to the disciples, I was sent only to the house of Israel. That's what he says. I was only sent to the lost sheep. When he came to earth, he came to convince Israel to let go of all that old system and turn to the new covenant. From there, those who would be saved would take the message on to the Gentile world. Here, it's still time in his ministry because he hasn't died on the cross yet to be ministering to the Gentiles. Oh, he'll minister to some Gentiles. Actually, he's going to minister to a Samaritan woman at the well, if you remember. She's Samaritan. You know what a Samaritan was? One of the parents was Jews and one of the parents was a Gentile. They were half-breeds. So he administered to them. But this is a full-blood Gentile. Has no Jewish blood in her. And he says to her, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, Yes, Lord. But even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master, their master's table. That is a poor translation. The word um, dogs there, in, in her answer should be this. It should say, Yes, Lord, but even the little dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the, their master's table. It's a term of endearment. How many of y'all had dogs when you were growing up? Or cats, it doesn't matter. Dogs here. How many of your parents said, don't feed the dogs on the table? How many of you did anyway? That's the picture that the woman said here. The kids love the dogs. They've got food they're supposed to be eating, but what do the kids do? Even the little dogs, the dogs that are in the house, will feed that dog, that child will feed that dog underneath the table. The dogs feed from the crumbs. And he answered and said, oh woman, your faith is great. Be it done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. Jesus had come to Israel to change the thinking process and the salvation process of Israel. In those days, if you were a Jew, anybody who was a Gentile was considered a dog. If you were a Roman, a Roman considered a Jewish person a dog. Well, a Roman person even thought an Arab was a dog. A Roman person thought an Egyptian was a dog. An Egyptian thought that an Arab was a dog. You following what's going on here? If your ethnicity was not of the right kind, you thought the other people were dogs. Over in Iran and Iraq, Iranian people in this Iranian people are Persians. They're not Arabs. Arabs are in Iraq, and even though they're both Muslims, the Iranians think the, the Arabs, the Iraqians are dogs, and the Iraqians think that the per Persians, the Iranians, are dogs. And in fact, in the Koran, the Koran says that anyone who is not a Muslim is a dog. Now you know I know that because I've studied through the Koran, I've taught through the Koran, I've compared it to the Bible. And what's interesting about that is, is I even sold a house that I had to a Muslim family and their first question was, have any dogs lived in this house? 
And they're, th they're talking about little puppy dogs because Muslims in America do not want to live in a house where the dogs are, have lived in the house. And I said to them, you know, I just read that in the Quran and you're talking about actual dogs? Are you talking about people who are not Muslim? No, we're talking about dogs. I said, let me go get my Quran. And I bring the Quran in and I read through it to them and they're Muslim. You got this? And I said, this context is not a physical dog like a puppy dog. This is anybody who's not Muslim is considered a dog. And he's looking, he said, oh, no one's ever taught me that. I said, but it's right. Th he said, yes, it's right there. Oh, this must be a corrupt translation. I said, we're not even getting it in our translation. We're getting it from the context. We had a fun time. Yesterday, it was Friday. Tom Joyce and I love Tom for this. We were having a discussion over at Operation Christmas Child. And Tom opened his Bible. And he points to the very last page, the book of Revelation. And he's on the last page. And he says, the great part about this is, I've read the last words of this book and it says, we win. To which I said, where is that? We win. He says, it, it's there. It's we win. I said, show me that verse. I can show you where Jesus wept, but we win? It's not there. You see, what we do is we make stuff up and we teach stuff wrong. And we say, hey, we win's in there. You can't find a verse that says we win. It's not there. you got to say it right because somebody's going to come along and warp it and change it and says, I know, the last verse of the Bible says, um, uh, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. We win. It's not there. All these people were dogs. That Phoenician woman knew that she was considered as a dog to the Israelites. And she was not offended by it because they were dogs to her. And the Romans understood this because the Romans understood that Jesus was talking about a person who was a different faith and a different ethnicity and they were considered dogs. It wasn't something that bothered them because that's just the way they all talked in the world. That was a terminology. Today it's offensive to us. You, you let somebody say to you, I can't feed you because i I got you know, to feed my kids before I feed the dogs. You'd say, somebody call me a dog? <laughs> that would bother us. It didn't bother them in those days because everyone understood what they were talking about. Well, Jesus leaves there in verse 31. And he went out from the region of Tyre and he came up through Sidon, which is about 25 miles north. Then he goes back down to the Sea of Galilee, which is a long ways when you make the triangle there. He comes down to the region of Decapolis. And the Decap Sea of Galilee is actually in the region of Decapolis, the ten cities in that area. And they brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty. And they entered and treated him to lay his hands upon him. And he took him aside from the multitude by himself. And get this, and he put his fingers in his ears. And after spitting, he touched his tongue with the saliva. And looking up to heaven with a deep sigh, he said to him, Ephatha, that is, be open. And his ears were open, and the impediment of his tongue was removed, and he began speaking plainly. Well, our English translators have not helped us with this passage. Uh, let me give you an example of what's going on. Most of y'all don't know, but we have a couple that... Um, come into our office and have been coming in for about four years. And you don't know this, but every year you do Christmas for them. And every Thanksgiving you do Thanksgiving for them. And every Easter you do Easter for them. And uh, every birthday you help them with birthday stuff. Uh, she was born deaf. And when she tries to make a sound, she can't s pronounce a single word. It's always, uh, mm, e, uh. All she says. Now he was in an explosion at about eight, and he talked as a child, totally deaf. Now he can come in and say things, but it doesn't always sound exactly right. He runs in and says, Doctor Jim, you got it, Doctor Jim. Hello, Doctor Jim's what he's saying. You got it. Now he's in his forties now. It's it's been a long time since he heard a word said, but he's trying to talk. Because this deaf man spoke with difficulty, it tells me that he probably heard it sometime in his life and had become deaf. Because he spoke with difficulty, it says. 
It didn't say that he was dumb as some of the other, in other words, not speaking a single word. That's the word dumb and what that means. Uh, and I know that's not politically correct today to use that word, but that's what the scripture would use it. It says he spoke with difficulty and he came in. This is a man who had never heard about what Jesus had done for all these people. His friends have brought him because he once could hear and he once could speak. And they bring him to Jesus. And Jesus does this incredible thing. He takes him off just a little ways by his side. He sticks his fingers in his ears. And then he touches, Jesus touches his tongue with saliva and touches the tongue of the man. And he says this Aramaic word, which Mark translates, actually, actually our English translators translate and says, be opened. But that's not what the word means. It means more than that. It means much, much more than that. It means be unbarred. Now, folks, every one of y'all in here have someone in your family that is entrapped in bars. And if not, you've had it in some time in your life. 21 years ago, little Lori walked into the Superdome with her fiancé and they hadn't done things right. She was pregnant with a child about four, five months. She had just gone through the turnstile in the, in the Super Bowl to go to a, uh, a football game. And she started holding her head. And foam starts coming out of her mouth. Blood's coming out of her nose. And she falls to the ground. She says, I feel sick. And that's the last words they ever heard her say. They picked her up, took her to the hospital. Four months later, she gives birth to a child. So she's in a coma. Speed on down 20 years, actually 19 years, Katrina comes into, comes into uh, New Orleans. They come in and take little Lori out of her hospital bed. She's been in a fetal position for 19 years. Her daughter never was held by her mother. Her daughter never heard her mother make a sound or a noise. Her, not, her, her daughter never ever saw her mother eat a bite of food through her mouth. It was always given her through a feeding tube. The tr Katrina comes in and the government comes in. They pull her out. They ship her to Dallas to a medical facility. The mother gets taken out. Mother of this, the mother of this uh, comatose daughter who's been taking care of her for nine years gets shipped to Denton. Another one of the comatose daughter's sisters ends up in San Antonio. Another one of her sisters ends up in Shreveport. The one who ends up in San Antonio, her eight-year-old son gets separated from, from her and she, he ends up at the Astrodome here in Houston. The mama in San Antonio finds out that she's her, that maybe Jesse is at the Astrodome and she hitchhikes to Houston from San Antonio to find her eight-year-old child. A little child has already been put into a foster care home down in Pearland and Mabel Jackson ends up at this church and we help her find her son. And miraculously, she finds her son. But we don't know where Mama is. We don't know where Sister Lori is. We don't know where the, the daughter is of this comatose one. We don't know where her other sister is. And we finally make connections. A year and a half later, the FEMA voucher is running up on in Dallas. And Mama... Mama Jackson has a heart attack and goes to the hospital and Mabel, who's here in, with us, has to leave her position with the post office and company and go up, uh, go up there to take care of her and she's, her job's in jeopardy. All that money's running out and we finally figure out that if we can just get them down here, get them here, Mabel's income can provide for the entire family and Mabel wants to do it. So you, folks... You help us. You didn't even know it. A medical airplane and an ambulance is secured to go up and get her and fly her down here. We go off in the truck one morning on the day she's supposed to be taken out up there of the house by the ambulance. <laughs> and some of our deacons who were going on vacation show up with their families at the house in Dallas and help us load the house into the truck in Dallas on their way to vacations. It's stormy, it's rainy when they take little Lori, Lori, little Lori now, she's 38 years old at this point in time, 
takes her out of the house, and they have to wait on the tarmac at Love Field for a long time before the weather is good to fly her down here in that air ambulance. Lo and behold, we show up at the house, and I send out an email, and people show up there, and we have the house set up before they drive in with her. Her bed is set up. It's been moved. God worked everything out. I tell you that whole story because two things have happened. There are two people who are barred by that event, those events. Number one, Lori's barred. Inside of that bed, she's still there today. Still today, she lies in the bed. She is entrapped inside the bars of her body with bars around her where she cannot speak. Oh, she knows if you come in, she can blink her eyes and she can look up and that. She reacts differently to different people's voices and she knows when it's mama that's there. She knows when it's sister that's there. She doesn't act very well when I come in because she doesn't know me. When I try to speak to her, she reacts and she tenses up. That's all she can do is just tense up. She's entrapped inside of a cage in her body. But her mama, for all these years, has also been entrapped. They can't go to family vacations. You know why? Because mama won't leave that daughter. She's trapped. She's barred. She's entrapped in a, in a world where she's going to take care of that daughter until the day she dies. She's in prison too. The family who had this man who was deaf and could not speak very well was imprisoned just as much as that man was imprisoned. And when the Lord stuck His fingers in the ears of that man and the saliva off that tongue, and I wish they'd use the right words. The word should say, He anointed His tongue with saliva. But they used the word touch. I don't understand why. When Jesus spit in the mud and put it on a man's eyes for the man to, to, to be healed, the words in the original say, He anointed His eyes with mud. But it says they smeared his eyes with mud. Here it says they touched his tongue with, with saliva. It's really, he anointed his tongue with saliva. And the man was healed and unbarred from all that was entrapping him. That all, everything that had got him down in his little wedge of life to where he could do nothing else but stay right where he was. He was trapped between a rock and a hard place and couldn't go anywhere. He was barred up. But Jesus released him from all of that just as He will release you from all of your bars that entrap you. Verse 36, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone, but the more He ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. They were just like you and me. I'm not supposed to tell you this, but i got to tell somebody. You know what I just happened? Now don't you tell anybody. I won't tell a soul. Oh my soul, you won't believe what I just heard. Oh, you know how it is. It doesn't take long for the grapevine to go all the way around the more he told, Jesus told them not to tell, the more they told. Look here. And they were utterly astonished, saying, He has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. That's our Lord Jesus. And they couldn't keep their mouth shut. And the Pharisees and scribes are infuriated. <laughs> What's sad about it is these people who are telling all this story will be the first to fall away when Jesus goes to trial. They won't hang on. They're astonished, but they, they don't, they're just superficial people. they got to tell the story, but they're just superficial people. Don't be a superficial person, so far, folks. If Jesus tells you to do something, keep it and do it. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are an incredible Lord and Savior, that you've healed the sick and the lame and the dumb and the deaf and She's even willing to heal from a distance. Lord, we got some folks in here right now that need to be healed from a distance, and we beg you and pray for that. Lord, we pray that you'll return an answer back to us that says, because great is your faithfulness, Jim Hastings. Great is your faithfulness, Joyce Walker. Great is your faithfulness. And the names go on and on and on. Your sick shall be healed. That's what we pray for. In your son's name, amen.